Celtic Badass of the Week showcases a different badass person of Celtic heritage each week. Those who exemplify the give no shit attitude and come on on top. They may come from our past or our present, but rest assured they come from all walks of life and legend. They are men, women, even old ladies and pirate queens. You don't have to be a muscled up Celt in a fur kilt swinging a mighty sword. You can just be a 4 foot 11 Welsh woman and suffragette who knows jujitsu. Most of these badasses are all too real. While some may be only legend, badass legends though. The only prerequisite for this title is Celtic blood and badassedness. Jennifer Musa. Now, this is a quote by her. Uh, Vuto told my brother-in-law to work on me. He said, get her vote. He thought the weakest link was a woman. He'd never been to Ireland, though. In the end, Vuto is the one who gave in. My brother-in-law never forgave me. Jennifer Musa was a seriously tough old lady. This Irish battle axe of a woman not only looks like Clint Eastwood's grandmother, but it's entirely believable that she was also the sort of person who might have flipped over a card table and beaten you to death with a broken off chair leg if she thought for a second that you were cheating during your weekly bridge game. Now while the above image alone might be enough to warrant a mutter of damn that old lady's a pretty badass, um, what's even more hardcore about her ferocious imposing stare is the fact that this take no bullshit old lady was well known throughout the lawless deserts of Central Asia as the Irish Queen of Balakistan and earned a name for herself by making sure everyone in Central Asia knew that she was the toughest mf -er in town. Now there's a hell of a title. The future queen of Balakistan was inauspiciously born in County Kerry, Ireland in 1911. Like any good Irish Catholic worthy of her rosary, this young farm girl was one of about a hundred kids. Though life in a packed out farmhouse wasn't exactly what she had in mind for her career path, instead she moved to Oxford where she trained to be a nurse. This is where things take an interesting turn for her because while living at Oxford Jennifer met and fell in love with a philosophy student named Quasi Musa. Now Quasi's father, incidentally, just so happened to be a pretty badass Afghan war leader who had led a successful cavalry charge against the British during the Battle of Maiwand in 1880. Now after the Second Anglo-Afghan War, the Brits decided that they didn't like the idea of a saber-swinging uh, maniac busting English asses all over Central Asia. So they, de they decided they expelled him from his tribal homeland in Kandahar. Now Quasi's dad moved across the mountains to a region called Balakistan, which sounds like a made-up place but is actually a province in present-day Pakistan. As a proven badass, it was easy for this guy to establish himself as the local tribal authority. Now Jennifer and Quasi got married, and in 1948, just a few months after Pakistan earned its independence from Britain, they moved to Balakistan, bought a 110-year-old mud hut in the town of Pishin, and immediately started decorating it with badass shit like giant-ass swords and pelts from white tigers, they had presumably killed with the aforementioned giant ass swords. Now right off the bat, Jennifer Musa's arrival in Pishin was kind of like a kick in the teeth to the local population. Here was this ancient tribal culture that believed pretty strongly in Purda, which is the religious belief that women were not allowed to be seen by men in public, and then their entire system was curb stomped by the arrival of this hot tempered mouthy Irish broad who refused to wear the burqa, pounded shots of Bailey's Irish cream, and didn't take shit from no one. Nobody knew what the hell to think. It was so weird that there came a rumor around town that this Jennifer was a British princess who had been given to Quasi as a gift by the British royal family as a reward for the Balakistonian prince killing a wild tiger with his bare hands. This was not the case, but he did kill the tiger with his bare hands. That is a fact. Now, Jennifer's husband died in an autom automobile accident in 1956, which is tragic, but Jennifer and Quasi owned the only car in the entire town. 
So with her husband dead and a young child to care for, 39-year-old Jennifer had two options, return home to Ireland or stay in Balakistan. She opted to stay so that the couple's son could remain with his extended family and presumably also because being a tribal leader in Balakistan is pretty sweet. But it was just getting started for uh, Jennifer Musa. After her husband died, this tough broad stepped in and started kicking metaphorical asses all over the place, getting involved in both local and national politics, and ferociously battling to protect the Balak people she loved and the rights of women who had been oppressed by unfair laws for generations. Now she joined the Pakistani National Freedom Party and got elected to the only Balakistani seat when Pakistan formed its first parliament in 1970, when President and noted world leader Zolfikar Ali Bhutto tried to bully her into ratifying a constitution that Jennifer felt didn't provide enough safeguards for Balakistan to preserve its regional autonomy, she told him he pretty much he could just kiss her pasty Irish ass. Now, Vuda was so adamant about wanting the ratification to be unanimous that he even tried to get Jennifer's own brother-in-law to pressure her to sign. But when the Constitution was signed in 1973, Jennifer held the distinction of being the only member of Parliament not to deposit ink onto it. If she didn't agree with that BS, she wasn't going to just bow down and go along with it because the leader of her country told her to. That's just how this chick rolled. Nothing could break her iron will. Now, in 1977, a coup by the Pakistani army overthrew democracy and dissolved the parliament. So the now former MP returned home to her beloved Balakistan. By this point, everybody in Balakistan had gotten over their precon uh, preconceptions about women and what they were capable of, and they all pretty much unanimously understood that Jennifer was the new sheriff in town. Now, I've never seen or never really been to rural Pakistan, but I kind of picture this region going down like, you know, fallout with camels. It's miles of hot desert, incredibly poor, ruled by tribal warlords, and even the shepherds out there are packing full, full auto assault rifles. Now still, despite this harsh, only the strong will survive environment, Jennifer Musis proved that she was the woman in charge. Local people from farmers to warlords would come to her to help arbitrate disputes and settle arguments, and what she said went. She also continued her work on women's rights, establishing literacy among the local female population, and when men weren't treating their women like she, you know, bullied them into acting a little more civilized by cracking them with sticks. The local police chief, who mentioned that he was scared of her growing up because when he would mess up, she'd drag him around town by his ear until he apologized. By the time that guy was 30 years old and running the police department, you can be damn sure he had nothing but respect for Mummy Jennifer. Now this mini fiefdom is even more awesome when you read that she didn't even really speak the language very well. According to her, I speak a little Fashtu and Urdu, but when I get really angry, I go down to English and they understand me just fine. It's like anything else, I suppose. Bad attitude transcends the language barrier. While it's pretty obvious that you didn't mess with this lady, the Irish queen of Balakistan also went out of her way to help people whenever she could. During the uh, Balak revolt in the late 1970s, when local freedom fighters were battling the Pakistani government, she worked with both sides to restore peace in the region. When the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan in the 1980s, she not only took refugees fleeing the destruction, but used her own money to build an ice factory that, so that she could produce cold water for the refugees and reliable refrigeration for a region that didn't have much in the way of electricity. Jennifer told Akbar to, pr to compromise and work together for a peaceable solution, but he decided to revolt anyways and got blown up for it. Jennifer remained in Balakistan for six decades, refusing to leave even when the neighboring Afghan province of Kandahar was overrun by Taliban insurgents. She raised her son to become a diplomat. He served as Pakistan's ambassador to both the United States and Russia and fight for what he believed in. 
and when she died in 2008 at the age of 90, her entire village came out to pay respects to the Irish Queen of Balakistan.